Hi everyone, and this is Pyjama Talks in the Field, and we are at uh, Web Expo Conference. And today my guest is Harry Roberts. Hi, Harry. Hey, good to see you, man. How good are you? you? Good. It's it's live concert. It's, it's offline conference, and we are here with a bunch of people. I don't know. It's good to be back. It's really good to be back. It feels surreal, but also it feels like it never went away. Like this is the first conference I've done in. 18 months. Wow. Um, and I expected like I'd feel weird and it'd be I'd forget things yeah, and it'd yeah. be different. But it's just feels like back to normal and it's so good to see so many people. Do you like online conferences and uh, delivering your talk online? Honestly, no, no, wow. not as much. As a speaker, I really like the audience feedback. Yes. I need to see if somebody's falling asleep, right? If someone's yeah, yeah. bored and not enjoying it. Yeah. And also, I think the whole point of attending conferences in the first place is because we spend way too much time yes. with our screens. Online conferences, it's really hard to have uh, that network. And yeah, you can have a Slack channel, but it's yeah. never quite the same. I do think that conferences have been very adaptive and they've done very well switching yeah. to online events. But offline all the way for me, yeah. much prefer it. Harry is an independent consultant and a freelance software front-end architect. Yep, I'm an independent, independent consultant, absolutely correct. But uh, I focus on front-end web performance, so less architectural stuff these days uh, and much more sort of site speed optimization. And uh, usually your clients, so they're saying, hey, we have slow front-end, can you help us? Or how it looks like? Pretty much exactly that. So what will happen is they will be aware that the site is too slow. Uh, and that could be just, they ran a lighthouse test yeah. and it came back really bad, or it could feel slow. And uh, that's usually what happens. They come to me to find out, is it bad that it's slow? Does it matter? Because for some clients, it doesn't really matter. But um, other clients, it could be millions of euro that they're losing out on. Wow. So uh, sometimes clients come to me already saying, look, we estimate that we are losing this much a year and we could make this much more. Uh, can you help us find the time, find those sort of milliseconds? Uh, so nearly always, it's uh, the clients are aware that something's wrong, but not sure what or why. Uh, and very rarely, clients like we know exactly what's wrong, we know how much it's costing us, we just yeah. need you to fix it. Um, so yeah, that's the usual setup. So those clients, isn't it a bit strange? So for example, if you have a front-end developers in sites that develop this product. Why do you not just uh, have uh, architects inside the team? Well, this is a really good question. And I, one of the first things I say to teams when I work with them is that I'm not here to tell you you did a bad job yeah. or you know, any, anything like that. I've got, I come from a really privileged position where I get paid only to focus on web performance. Mm -hmm. Whereas developers inside the team, they've got deadlines, internal yeah. politics, feature changes. Yeah. Shitty, shitty manager. Right, yeah, all of that stuff. Whereas I've got none of that to deal with. So I always tell, because sometimes I work with companies and developers don't like me. They think, who's this guy coming yeah, in telling yeah. us what we did wrong? Right, sure. Right. right, exactly. So normally I just tell, I tell the development team, look, you've done a great job. You've built a website that works, right? That's great. All we're going to do now is we're going to work together to make yeah. it as fast as we can. Uh, and normally that's a really effective way of working. But kind of, I guess, a broad answer to the question is it's way too expensive to have specialists in teams. No one would hire me full time. I'd be useless as a yeah. full time member of staff because you shouldn't need me all the time anyway. That level of specialism means that, you know, I've had to sacrifice. Like my JavaScript knowledge is terrible yeah. to focus so much on something else. I used to write a lot of CSS. I haven't looked at any CSS for the last two years because I focus so much on web perf. So I think that's the main reason why teams don't do it themselves is because they just lack that specialism. Yeah. I don't think they need the specialism anyway. And usually your work uh, ends after you point the problem or you fix it too? Um, I very rarely do implementation because the developers can do that. Um, normally what I say to clients is, I'll find all the problems, I'll get you a, a backlog, um, and your engineers can fix it. Now, if you need me to fix it, we can look at that. But generally speaking, it's quicker for the developers to do it themselves because they know the code base, they know the product, they can work faster. Yeah. They've got dev environments set up. So me getting all that stuff set up usually takes far too long for how quick the fixes are. On particularly big projects, like really big clients, what I'll normally do is sort of be on a retainer with them. So like uh -huh. one day a week, I will work on their project with them while they're fixing it. Yeah. just so that the engineers can get down to work, do work through the backlog, 
but then message me like, hey, what do you mean by this? Or this isn't working how I expected. Yeah. And I work alongside them that way. Have you ever had this uh, experience when you, you come to project and uh, understand that it's way beyond fixability? It's like, it's better to burn it to the ground. Um, yes, I've had a couple of those. I had one earlier this year. And what was really kind of sad about this is the site was a real mess, real mess. And um, you could see in all of their data, their performance data, like it got really bad around November last year. What happened? And they said, oh, that's when we rebuilt the site. And I was like, this site looks like it's 100 years old. It's so clunky and broken. And it turns out it was only four months old. And I was like, oh no, this is bad news. So um, that was just a huge long list of really simple errors. Like you've got a syntax error in your head tags, which is causing the page to render incorrectly. Yeah. Fix, fix your syntax error. Just really simple stuff. I think this is a dream job for many people because first of all, you don't have a boss manager and no one is telling you. Second thing, you can, you can deal with a lot of interesting stuff. You don't uh, fix like simple errors, right? Because what's the point? To, and so how to come from, from this point when you are a front-end developer to, to being a consultant? Is it networking only? So you should have a lot of connections. I say this all the time. The single biggest thing for my career was having a blog. Mm -hmm. um, I started blogging in 2007. Uh, it got really popular. Uh, so I was working like a full-time job as a developer, but then on an evening, I was doing research work and doing like stuff that no one had done before and sort of inventing techniques and just writing it all down. That got more and more and more popular than I started getting asked to speak at conferences. So it's, it's networking in a way, but it's more like uh, publishing and just being very present and being yeah. Yeah. making yourself present, I guess, people aware of you. So after several years of that, um, I started getting inquiries like, hey, look, all this stuff you're writing about, can you come and do it for us? I was like, well, I can't because I've got a job. Yeah. And after a while, I was like, Why not? I, I need to stop saying no and start saying yes. So yeah. I, I left my job, uh, set up my own company, and that was seven years ago. Wow, wow, congrats. But this, but this time when you have a, this is, I believe, the most, uh, the hardest part. So you have a full-time job and you have to work at your blog, at your uh, networking, at your, I don't know, speaking. So it wasn't super hard to combine this thing. It didn't feel difficult at the time because I genuinely enjoyed it. But I was, I mean, in 2007, I was 17. So I had a lot of energy, didn't feel like it didn't feel like a struggle. Nowadays, now I'm, now I'm 30, it's like, eh, I don't really want to write a blog post when I get in. I just want to have a beer and yeah. watch Netflix, right? So at the time, it didn't feel difficult, but it was a lot of work. A lot of people either don't have the time, uh, you know, they might have families, right? Small family yeah. to look after. So a lot of people don't have the time, but I still think it's the most important thing I did. Uh, yeah. And in hindsight, it was a great investment for my career. But do you feel, maybe it's not true, but sometimes for speakers, and who speaks very well. Sometimes people, the audience, they would say, oh, this is talking heads. What can you know about, what do you know about stuff? Because you, you talk too smoothly. Right, yeah, yeah. One of the most important skills I think a consultant needs is um, being able to convince people, be convincing. Not lying, right? Not kind of telling people stuff that's not true. You, you obviously need technical capability. You need to be able to do the job. Now, there's a load of developers out there, way cleverer than me. Most of them are cleverer than me. But one skill I seem to have is that I can deal with businesses very well, so I can deliver and I can sort of tell companies how to, how to react and how to respond and, and that kind of stuff. You're right, that does mean that at conferences, developers think I'm from the other side of the fence. Yeah. Like, oh, this guy doesn't have a proper job. He doesn't know what it's like. He's not, he's just on stage. He doesn't do real work. So I try very hard to do constant research to kind of, find things that are worth writing about, whether that's hidden browser bugs that no one's ever found before, or like the talk I'm giving in a couple of hours time, there's some stuff in there that nobody knows about because I only discovered the browser bug like two weeks ago. So wow. there's some stuff in there where I'm really hoping to convince the audience that I've got stuff worth listening to. I still do real work. Um, and normally audiences do receive my, uh, my talks very well, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You go up there like, 
Oh, this guy's got a shirt on. Why is he not, why is he not wearing a Vim t-shirt? He's not one of us. Some people, they, I don't know about performance. I have this bias, how to say, is that some people, they think it's extremely hard because they don't know nothing about performance. So they think like, oh, it's, it's rocket science. But other part of the developers, they're like, okay, I have DevTools and I have Lighthouse. So it's extremely easy. You're just looking at the numbers. Maybe this way, some developers, they think, yeah, performance is not hard at all. I mean, absolutely right. And what I find interesting is I will go to companies and the developers will tell me, yeah, come on, we don't, we don't need you. The site's yeah. not even that slow. Our users don't mind the slow website. You know, they expect, you know, it'll be a full client rendered JavaScript application. And they'll say, oh yeah, but our users expect to wait a long time for it to load. Yeah. And I just say, well, why did your boss email me then? Like, why, why am I here? Tooling is getting easier and easier, which kind of scares me a bit because my job is that I know the tools. Yeah. And now they're getting more accessible and easier to read and they give better advice than ever before. It means that developers are way better equipped, which means that I need to find the really interesting stuff to keep relevant, yeah, right? True, true. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's either one of those things where people know nothing about it and they don't know where to start, or the, the tooling is becoming so available that people can dip in really slowly to start with, find little bits to fix, and then more and more. And I think it's, it, it's getting more, far more attention, but it's still a huge problem. Like sites are really, really slow still. And nine times out of 10, what I find on client websites is just fundamentals. It's really simple stuff. Yeah. Because nowadays people jump in and they learn JavaScript without learning HTML, or they learn React without learning JavaScript. And most of the times I'm fixing websites, it's like, you can just change these lines of HTML around yeah. and it's gonna get loads faster. And it's because I'm a nerd and I read the specs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, knowing exactly how a browser works is a really, really useful bit of knowledge. Um, so yeah, most of the time what I end up dealing with with clients and with development teams yeah. is just really fundamental stuff which they find interesting because it's like, holy shit, I yeah. never knew the browser could do that. Maybe you are like, uh, you're like psychologist, website psychologist, <laughs> because usually, not usually, but sometimes people, they have problems and they know about the problems, say they know how to fix them, but they need some, some kick. Yeah. And uh, like, if they hire you, <laughs> not people like companies, so they have, okay, we spend some money on this guy, we should fix it right now. Yeah, this is, this is a really important aspect of my work. You're absolutely right. Most developers know it's a problem, they know where to start, but the boss, it's the same with technical debt. Yeah. Managers don't normally give enough time for fixing technical debt. Yeah. But the moment you put a week in a calendar and say, look, this is the week we work on performance, then it gets the attention. And you can do a lot of great work in just one week. Yeah. The only problem with that is, as soon as I leave, it goes back downhill again. Do you work on, uh, for example, some systems, metric systems? So you fix problem and then uh, give people uh, tools, give companies the tools. Okay, guys, this is metric in your CI/CD, mm -hmm. and if it if it is red, it means that call me. Yeah. So I tend to find that larger clients take that kind of stuff more seriously. Um, a lot of clients just. They'll just have a workshop, perhaps, and like tell us how to use DevTools better and tell us how to find things. And that the project isn't really about one specific website. So the bigger, sort of more consultancy-based projects, um, I, I sort of tell clients, look, there's no point working together at all unless we know what to do afterwards. Um, two things is, one, know when to stop. At some point, making the site faster won't make you any more money. Yeah. It'll just cost you money because you're spending six weeks chasing 50 milliseconds. Yeah. So know when to stop. And then second thing is know what to do when you've stopped. So what are we going to measure? Which metrics should it be? And the problem with this is it's usually quite expensive to do it properly because uh -huh. ideally what you'd want to do is have very business facing metrics such as every time we slow down by 500 milliseconds, yeah. conversion goes down by 1.2% or yeah. whatever it is. That's, that's expensive to track because you need to spend money on good quality RUM software. Yeah. But clients who take performance seriously, those are the kind of metrics I will leave them with so that they're not really worried about their lighthouse score. They're not worried about start render. They're worried about money. And that's really that's what everyone cares about, right? 
talking about more like uh, technical stuff. So do you feel that right now browsers, they are extremely complicated machines. Inside the browser, there are plenty of features that you never heard of. I don't know, Project Fugu, all this uh, web platform. And uh, do you feel that browsers, they become more and more complex? And in one point of, uh, of history, I mean, we will fail over them because they will be so, so gross, so yeah. big. The web platform is expanding at an enormous rate. Yeah. All the new APIs, everything that's landing, it gives developers so much opportunity. Developers rarely use it. You, know, you never yeah. really hear of many companies, oh, we've got a full PWA, or yeah. we're using push notifications for useful things, we're using background sync. But the thing is, all of these things, yeah, they do get added to browsers, browsers get heavier and heavier. And the problem is, once it's in a browser, it's very difficult to remove. Yeah. Because those companies that are using the features, you can't remove that. that actually makes things, from, from my point of view, from my job, makes my job a lot easier. So it means browsers are very stable, very reliable. Because Chrome 93, like the current most recent version of Chrome, that has to render a web page that isn't even built yet. But it also has to render a web page that was built 20 years ago. Yeah. And that stability means that from a performance point of view, fundamentally how browsers render web pages will never change. It can't do, because most of the internet would break. So from a performance point of view, it doesn't really matter how big they get, yeah. because the important stuff can't ever change. They're not allowed to change it, because it would just be, it would just break so many websites. But does it mean that it kind of slows us down? Maybe we would have uh, AR, VR, uh, browsers, all this stuff, or 3D, whatever, but because it should render page from 90s, it, it can be like this. I think you'd have to just layer on a whole new chunk of browser functionality, wouldn't you? You'd have to have a big fork of like, is this a web page or is this an experience? Yeah. But this is where I'm getting completely out of my depth now. I've got no idea how they would solve that practically. But it does mean that, I mean, if you look at web pages from 20 years ago, yeah. they're still very similar to what we have today. We don't see much innovation on the web. Even, well, so fundamentally, the way websites are built hasn't really changed. Yeah, yeah couple of columns, yeah, we've got responsive, we've had that for 10 years, whatever. But fundamentally, browsers, uh, sorry, web pages haven't changed much. Uh, and maybe that is a limitation. Maybe that is because we're kind of, we've got this snapshot of time and we have to keep everything sort of fairly similar to what it was decades ago. And I heard one opinion uh, from one speaker. He, he will be at this conference speaking about accessibility, that actually we're getting things worse because back in the days, HTML was the most accessible thing because HTML itself is accessible by default. But adding JavaScript, adding frameworks, adding a lot of things, we made it inaccessible. I mean, for people with disabilities and other stuff. So we're kind of like worsening life for ourselves. The thing I'm really keen to say is this isn't developers' fault. Like, frameworks should make it easy to do the right thing. Yeah. And a lot of them don't. Like, you look at docs, I mean, they're getting better and they're working on it. But if you look at docs from like React years ago, dib, 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 everything's just dibs, no yep. semantics. Frameworks were never built with performance in mind. We've seen a huge shift and framework authors are listening and they're doing really great work. But yeah, the problem starts really with the frameworks. I, I, I'm really keen not to blame developers yep. because they're just doing the best they can. Uh, but yeah, we did see a massive sort of drop off a cliff when everything stopped being dib, dib, dib. There's a, there's a Google tool that I use for performance testing. I don't know why, I was trying to like, I was trying to inspect it to move something around for a screenshot, for a slide, and I just inspected the page, and it was just divs everywhere. Yeah. Bits of text that were clearly a heading, div. And it just reminded me of something that um, a friend of mine, Leonie Watson, she's a phenomenally talented speaker. Um, and unfortunately, she, she's blind, so she has a very different experience on the web to most people. And she said the one improvement she would like to see, the one like most inaccessible thing about the web is people not using the correct HTML tags. She said, you know, if, if people just yeah. learned about semantics, her experience would be so much better. Yeah. And it is like really simple stuff. Like yeah. we've kind of lost. There is one term, uh, technological singularity, because browsers are getting uh, more complicated. And I, I remember 10 years ago, Web and front end in general was way easier. We, or like 20 years ago, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, that's it. But right now, to be a front end engineer, you should know 
a lot of things like how to build it with Webpack or any other bundler, new bundlers, ES build, white, whatever. Sometimes in some positions, I even uh, see that as a front end engineer, you should know uh, Kubernetes because you should pack it. But I think like, will we see in future that front end uh, will be the same as rocket science or something like that? I was so lucky when I got into web development because like you said, it was HTML and CSS. I started learning web development just after table-based design. So I didn't even have to learn tables. I started with web standards. You know, knowing a bit of CSS3 is what got me well known. Simple stuff about, oh yeah, you can use border radius. It was one of my first blog posts that got popular. Nowadays, there are way more developers competing in the same space, which means that employers can go crazy with their job specs. Oh, you need to know all of this, you know. You need 12 years experience in React, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Impossible, but you need it. I do not envy like people coming into the industry. They have got such a difficult challenge ahead of them. They're expected to know so much. The only kind of good thing I think is that the amount of resources nowadays is huge, like boot camps, online courses, YouTube blogs. Videos, yeah. yeah, exactly. So the, the, the content is there, but it's just the expectation of how much people have to learn is it's really crazy. So wrapping things up, what do you think? What are the most, the easiest things about performance everyone can check right now? People say things like, oh, optimize your images. But the thing is, images are asynchronous. So yeah, optimize them, but they're not going to have that much of an effect on your performance. Probably the single biggest thing I tell every client is self-host all of your assets. Yeah. Like, it's a very specific answer to your question. But just thinking about it, I see every single client project get this wrong. They will use Google Fonts um, style sheets, which is render blocking on a third party domain. Yeah. They will link out to, um, I don't know, Max CDN for Bootstrap. Yeah. And the amount of network latency just lost to doing that is, is huge. So I think really simple is take a look at all of your static assets, all of your render blocking assets. Um, Self-host them and watch the site get loads faster. It's going to take you five minutes and it'll save you so much time. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and good luck with your talk because you were talking a couple of hours. Yeah, and uh, good luck with, uh, with, with your performance. Thank you, man. I really, yeah. really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much and see you next one. Thank you.